America is the most individualistic country in the world, and its roots run deep. Back in the 1800s, American author Horatio Alger wrote almost 100 rags-to-riches novels that featured impoverished boys who rose up from humble backgrounds to affluence by pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps with nothing but personal hard work and determination. Alger's novels were sold by the thousands, and America believed them. That's why America's traditional heroes have often been lonesome cowboys or pioneer settlers who made their home in the Wild West with their bare hands. And more recently, why Silicon Valley pioneers like David Packard, William Hewlett, and Steve Jobs or industrialists like Henry Ford or Elon Musk are heroes. But truth be told, these individual success stories are often as fictional as the hero in a Horatio Alger novel. Much more often, success is achieved by teams rather than individually. And this is also true of Christian ministry. God has given us the task of building his church, but he doesn't ask us to do it alone. Stay tuned as Kent Edwards, Vicki Hitzkiss, and Nathan Norman discover in our final look at the Gospel of Mark, the help Jesus promised his early disciples and still provides for us. Welcome to Crosstalk, a Christian podcast whose goal is for us to encourage each other to not only increase our knowledge of the Bible, but to take the next step beyond information into transformation. Our goal is to bring the Bible to life, into all our lives. I'm Brian French. Today, Dr. Kent Edwards, Vicki Hitzkiss, and Nathan Norman continue their discussion through the Gospel of Mark. And if you have a Bible handy, turn to Mark chapter 15, verse 42, to chapter 16, verse 8, as we join their discussion. Few things are more frightening in life than feeling abandoned, deserted, left behind. Nathan, Vicki, have you ever seen people struggle because they are alone? Oh my goodness, yes. Oh and, yeah. And the reality is, is that people, they have this built need to talk. Uh -huh. And so that's often why when I have people within the community that they don't get out much or they live by themselves, man, they just talk. Like all of the things that they never said are just <laughs> built up. And and there's some just wonderful blessed saints. And I know if if I see their number come up on my phone or or they catch me on Sunday morning, I just have to mentally hunker down and say, you know what? I need to minister to them by just listening because they haven't talked to anyone, you know, for a couple of days and they've stored this all up and they just need to get it out. And just to riff on that, my experience has been when you go to uh, Home for the Elderly, um, mm -hmm. I go in to visit one parishioner and I see all these hands coming out, all these eyes fixing on me. Don't, don't just spend time with that person. Right. They're hungry too. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I can just picture that, Kent. They're hungry too. What a way to say that. Yeah, the, the hands just come forward, just reaching, reaching. Yeah. But I find sometimes that um, when I have found myself in years past studying for an exam, struggling to understand a concept, but it's late at night and there's no one to ask for. I feel abandoned. I, I feel alone. There are um, times when you're in a work environment and things are not going well, then you're afraid to talk to anyone. And what do I do because I'm alone? Who are my allies? Who are my friends? Who could help me? I think there are many situations in life that we struggle with. And loneliness and isolation is a major problem. Are there times when you felt alone? I have personally, that's a terrible feeling. I've, I've moved away before and, and didn't mm -hmm. know anybody. That's an awful feeling. And then I have professionally where I have needed to know how to do something and yeah. didn't know how to get the answer. Re reading a book wasn't going to help me. Right. And I just, I just wanted to say to somebody, could you just show me how to do this? And yeah. And new people knew how, but I wasn't one of them. And I, I just I just wanted to call someone and say, just show me how to do this. And couldn't, didn't know anybody. I remember my father saying to me once, the loners in life are losers. Mm -hmm. And when I'm alone, I, I just hear him say that the loners in life are losers. And I think, oh, man, that is so true. And our culture is so geared to be alone, to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And 
boy, that's a bad way to tackle life. It sure is. I, I can remember when I was a teenager, I had a, an illness that lasted for five years. And so, and it also oh. flipped my sleep schedule. Huh. And so I was like insomniac and I was up in the middle of the night for, you know, like eight hours by myself. Wow. And, and when you're a teenager, who wants to hang out with a sick kid? Right. right? And, and, and as you're sick, who has the energy to do anything with anyone? So I went through a long extended period of just feeling alone and feeling isolated and in incredibly depressed. It is, uh, it is a darkness that I can't fully describe. Hmm. Wow. In fact, I think that's one of the reasons the importance of, of having help is one of the reasons crosstalk has been uh, so successful. There's nothing lonelier sometimes than being a pastor sitting alone in your office, struggling to um, understand God's word and how best to communicate it. And one of the things we offer is uh, we work with those who are studying in small groups. We give them community, we give them coaching, and that's critical. There's uh, nothing more frustrating than, as you said, Vicki, trying to find an answer to a problem and it's not gonna come out of a book. Who's gonna help me? Who's gonna show me what I'm doing wrong? Who can help me go forward? I think it's important to, to keep that context in mind about the challenge of loneliness when we come to the last section of the Gospel of Mark. As we focus today at the end of this wonderful Gospel, it's helpful to remember where we've come from. You remember way back in chapter 1, after John the Baptist was introduced, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. And do you remember what he said in verse 15? I don't remember it, but I can cheat and read it. It says, <laughs> the, the time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So that was a huge proclamation that Jesus made to the people. The kingdom of God has come near. Whew. Nathan, can you remind us of what Jesus is referring to when he speaks of the kingdom of God? Well, to his first century listeners, they would have interpreted that as God's rule finally coming and mm -hmm. being mitigated through Israel and touching the entire world. God's dominion is finally here. His power has come. They didn't understand fully what that meant and that Jesus's kingdom is not of this world and the inaugurated eschatology of already not yet, but but it meant God's rule was coming. And that is much better than this upside down dark world that we live in. So how long have the people who heard this announcement by Jesus, how long have they been waiting to hear that news? Well, how old do you think the world is? <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, ever, ever since Adam and Eve fell, but, but certainly more intentionally since the, uh, the time of the patriarchs and Moses and, uh, and King David, they were awaiting for this forever king who would come and rule from David's line forever and ever. Amen. Okay. How do they know that God's kingdom has not yet arrived? Because <laughs> everything stunk. <laughs> 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 no, you don't, they don't see God's reign and his rule and his righteousness as they look around the world, right? Right. They see Rome. They see it with its unjust practices, its immorality, its idolatry, barbarism, its cruelty. I mean, everything that is wrong with the world seems to be surrounding them and they're living in the midst of it, right? Right. You have children who rebelled. You have uh, broken relationships with spouses. You have sickness. You have illness. You have disease. The list goes on. Right. And so what's fascinating is after Jesus makes that announcement, I was stunned in the early part of Mark to see that Jesus went out, called people to be his disciples to help him bring in this kingdom and he called fishermen to come and help him bring in his kingdom vicky does that surprise you that he would call commercial fishermen to be his disciples to, to bring in this glorious kingdom well it doesn't surprise me because i'm looking back on it and i i know how the plot goes but <laughs> oh don't give away the ending <laughs> yeah but, but, but you would think he would call princes or kings or you know somebody to be amazingly powerful to sit in his court and he you know he picks guys that smell like dead herring <laughs> <laughs> And they weren't known for their high education level leadership abilities. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. 
they were just peasants of the sea, farming the sea, good, hardworking, blue collar people that uh, no one else had targeted for significant responsibility, right? Right. So as the story of Mark continues, it makes me wonder how the, the uh, disciples would have responded when they saw how Jesus uh, was welcomed. I mean, immediately after he begins his ministry, Satan attacks him. The religious leaders turn against him. And here you are saying, how could I solve that problem? This is the opposition he faces. What could I do? And, and Jesus is uh, perhaps a little bit discouragingly very honest when he tells his disciples in Mark chapter 4 that the kingdom of God at this point is as big as what? A mustard seed. Yeah, so basically invisible. <laughs> Hi, guys, it's you and me, and that's all we got. But he says, it's going to grow into the largest of all garden plants. This is a kingdom that will become one that covers the entire world, even as the Old Testament prophets said it would. And how is this going to happen? Well, he showed them. He's the one who calmed the storm, remember? He's the one oh, yeah. who showed that he is God, and with a, just his word, the storm they thought was going to drown them suddenly ended. It was Jesus who healed the demoniac, cast the man who was filled with demons into the pigs, not them. It was Jesus who encouraged them when they were overwhelmed by the challenges of ministry. It was Jesus who taught them about what are the distinctives of this kingdom that they were going to be part of and the requirements of serving in his kingdom. It was Jesus who made it clear what their ministry priorities should be. I mean, <laughs> Jesus announced the kingdom of God and you cannot minimize the importance of Jesus in bringing this prophecy to bear, right? Right. I don't think the disciples said, oh, good thing you got us on your team. With our help, you'll be able to accomplish this. I think by and large, they were sitting back and saying, wow, good thing we got him as our leader. Have you ever known you were going to win because you had a uh, one specific individual to help you? I'm not much of an athlete. In fact, I'm not an I athlete. Just thinking that you get the you get the right player on a team and they they're sure they're going to win and and that guy gets hurt and they're sure they're going to lose and they're usually well, right. Yeah, well, back in the day when I was um, pastoring up in Canada, one of the teams that was my favorite were the Edmonton Oilers, and they were my favorite because they had Wayne Gretzky. All right, and I could be confident every year he's going to win, and you know. That's one of the reasons I became a Patriots, and now I'm a somewhat Buccaneers fan, for those of you who follow the NFL, because Tom Brady wins more games than anybody else, and it's uh, fun to cheer for him, because a team that has him can be pretty confident they're going to do well. I think that's how the disciples were feeling. We may not have the strongest team, but with him on our team, how are we going to lose? But in Mark 15, as we fast forward to the very end of this gospel, things don't look so good. We've seen Jesus betrayed by his closest allies, falsely accused of crimes, mocked, tortured, abandoned by God the Father himself, and finally, with an agonizing cry, died. The hero is gone. The all-star is off their team. And look what happened next. Vicki, would you mind reading verse 40 and following for us? Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. It was the day before the Sabbath. So as the evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died, and when he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Do you hear the tone of that passage? dark, depressing. I find it interesting that we saw last week that all of Jesus' disciples deserted him. 
all ran away. But when all of his male followers abandoned him, it's fascinating for me to see that many of his women followers did not abandon him. Among them, Mary Magdala, from whom we know earlier, Jesus had delivered from seven demons. He was her hero. Jesus had transformed her life. And now she saw him die and be buried. And then there's Mary, the mother of Jesus, the son she had given birth to, raised, misunderstood, I think, at times, but certainly loved, it was gone, with no mention of her husband. She could be facing a future of lonely widowhood. And she watched her son die, be taken down from the cross, and placed in a tomb. The women had personally witnessed Jesus' death on the cross. They personally seen his dead body wrapped for burial. And they watched as that body was sealed in a tomb hewn out of solid rock. It's hard to imagine more depressing scene than that, is there? Mm. It's hard to imagine the kind of grief, the level of grief that they would be experiencing. This is their hero the one that they loved, and he was gone. I think I've mentioned on an earlier podcast that a number of years ago now, my middle brother was killed in a car accident just three days before Christmas. I remember how deeply affected I was that he was gone. The loss, the grief that I experienced. But I remember watching my parents when they learned of his death. And that was far greater. Their grief was so deep, it shook them to their souls. And I think that's what we're seeing here. They're seeing their hero, Mary's son, gone. And what about the disciples who had abandoned Jesus in Gethsemane? And Peter, who had denied him three times. Surely the news would have spread quickly that Jesus was gone. How would they have been feeling right now? I wonder how he felt. I wonder if he, you know, it had been predicted by Jesus that Peter would betray him. And in mm -hmm. fact, he did. So he would have felt that guilt. I wonder if there was a sense of relief that, hmm. oh, good, I'm, I'm free because he's dead. Hmm. He wasn't who he said he was. Yeah. You think there was any of that? There could have been some some of that feeling of, I dodged that bullet. My guess with Peter is he probably felt guilty for feeling that. Yeah. 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 So then it's like guilt compounded upon guilt. I feel a little bit of relief. I'm horrified that he's dead. I'm relieved that I didn't get arrested and killed and follow through with my promise. And I'm a terrible person for feeling that way. And yet confusion because Jesus predicted that he would betray him and he did and you know, all the, all these right. feelings going on. I've got to go back to my mother-in-law and show her that right. I, I've wasted the last three years of my life. I, I've got to go back to my family. I've wasted three years. I, I have nothing to show for it. And, and he'd remember all the miracles Jesus did. What about all that? Right. I mean, there'd just be so much going on in his head, I would think. Confusion. Yeah. But what about the, the kingdom of God Jesus had promised? I mean, Jesus made that announcement. It is immediately after the, the fishermen decided to follow Jesus, right? Right. I mean, I think they really believed it. I think they were convinced that he was the Messiah. I mean, Peter confessed that verbally when Jesus asked them on a previous occasion, who do, you who think do people that think am? that I am and who do you think that I am? I think they thought this was going to happen. And now what would happen with the death of Jesus? Could they bring it in? Obviously not. No. All was lost. What a waste. A waste of the life of Jesus. The waste of three years of their life following him. Not to mention the loss of their reputation. But chapter 16? That's a game changer. Perhaps one of the most emotional paragraphs ever written. Nathan, can you walk us through this? 
It says, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices to anoint Jesus' body on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. <laughs> How do you think the women would have responded when they showed up and saw the tomb where Jesus had been laid was empty? Again, they'd be confused. They were scared, obviously. Uh -huh. And when they heard that message, assuming they believed it right away, they'd be thrilled. Man, my hunch is they did believe it. Why? Well, there's an angel there telling them that uh, <laughs> <laughs> that it happened. That's not a normal occurrence. <laughs> but it's and, actually it's interesting because he doesn't seem like very angelic here. He's not glowing. There isn't strobe effects. It's just a young man dressed in a white robe. Maybe it's the one that naked man left in the Garden of Gethsemane <laughs> running away. <laughs> now there's imagination at work. <laughs> yeah, the, the news would have been so hopeful, almost too good to be true, but but too unbelievable to be false. It was. It says it was too good to be true because it says trembling and bewildered, they fled the tomb and they yeah. said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Right. Who do you think they were afraid of? Oh, the Romans. Oh, I think everything. Oh, I think they're, yeah, I think they're afraid of the Romans. But I think it's fascinating that Mark here shows these women, they were personal eyewitnesses of Jesus' death. They saw him on the cross. They saw him die. They saw his body be removed. They saw him wrapped in burial claws. They saw him placed in a solid rock tomb and a stone be rolled in front of them. And they are the ones who came and saw the stone rolled away and Jesus gone. This is like a detective show where you've got a chain of evidence. You see that? Right. I mean, this is unbroken. The very people who saw him die and put in that tomb were the ones who discovered that he is gone. No other explanation except what that the man, uh, the angel told them about. I think they realized to the core of their being, Jesus, who was dead, was alive. How do you think the disciples themselves would have responded when the women told them? <laughs> do you want my cynical answer? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I, I think by and large, they wouldn't have believed them. This text is why New Testament scholars, whether they're believers or not, largely believe in the empty tomb because mm -hmm. women were not believed in the ancient Near East culture, not, not by the Greeks, not by the Romans, not by the Jewish people. They weren't able to give testimony in a court. And the reality is that Mark recorded this because it's what actually happened. And if he was making this up, he never would have chosen women as the people because they weren't considered reliable witnesses in the ancient world. So I think the disciples probably going in with that bias, they heard it and thought, ah, you're crazy. No, no, that didn't really happen. But there's probably a little bit of seed going like, wait a minute, maybe it is. Maybe there is hope. And to me, one of the most exciting verses in this gospel is in verse seven. Vicki, read it for us. I says, but go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Ooh. It's interesting that he says his disciples and Peter. <laughs> mm -hmm. Says Peter Why do you think that disciple. is? Well, I think he's saying, make sure you tell Peter this. Yeah, I think because Peter would have thought, am I disqualified? Right? I mean, you see that as a theme in the end of the Gospel of John, in John 21. He thought perhaps that because of his unconscionable denial of Jesus, um, even after the warning, that he would be on the outs. But um, the angel told the women, tell his disciples, including Peter, he is going ahead of you in Galilee, and then you will see him just as he told you. I think this is really significant because 
We saw last week that Jesus' death paid the price for the sins of humanity. Remember, Nathan, you reminded us that the temple veil had been torn? From top to bottom, like a piece of paper. <laughs> and, and that showed what? That man was reconciled to God, that the division between God and humanity has been ripped apart by the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes. So salvation is possible. There's a, there's a gospel to tell. And secondly, I think that this verse tells us that Jesus' resurrection means that he is alive and well. He is not stuck in the grave. He is alive and well. And that means, what about this kingdom? He can keep his promise to bring in the kingdom of God. And what will that look like? What will this kingdom of God look like? Well, in Mark chapter 9, Jesus gives us a hint when he says, He says, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Hmm. That's a so problem, isn't it? Hmm, yes and no. There's an immediate fulfillment, and I think there's a long-term fulfillment. The immediate fulfillment, I think he's talking about the birth of the church. I think we see this in the book of Acts. When the church Jesus that could founded because of Jesus' work on the cross exploded, it's there where we begin to catch a glimpse of, of what it means for God's kingdom to be here on earth, a colony, if you will, where transformed people live under his reign and rule. I know it's not perfect. I know it's not the ultimate fulfillment, but it's the first time that's happened. And secondly, I think it's a promise that it will be fulfilled fully and completely when Christ returns, Satan is ultimately defeated, and we behold his glory and live forever in his presence. Whew. This is a promise. Because he's alive, the kingdom he promised, it's coming sooner and later. But secondly, I think it means not only is he going to keep his promise, but he tells his disciples, come to Galilee and I will meet you. I will be with you. Come back. Come back to Galilee. That's where it all began. This gospel has gone full circle. Jesus began his ministry in Galilee, met his first disciples in Galilee, and it's ending at the end of this gospel back in Galilee. Jesus has not left them. Jesus has not abandoned them. And I don't think he's asking people like us to build the kingdom of God in our own strength. He's not asking them to do it in their own strength. Not even Peter. Jesus has not abandoned them. They will continue to minister as they have in the past. They will continue to minister even with Jesus. I think that means that we can be sure that the kingdom of God is coming. And that even now, as the church grows, this glimpse will grow because, not because of our own strength, not because of our own abilities, because we do continue to minister with Jesus. And I think this is stated most clearly in that famous passage at the end of Matthew chapter 28, when we read the 11 disciples went to Galilee where Jesus had told them to go, and Jesus came to them and said, Vicki, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I am with you always, always. We are not abandoned. Jesus always keeps his word and the kingdom he promised is here in his church. This colony of the church of the kingdom of God today, that that's a reality. The church has grown with the help of Christ leading it until it's become the largest organization the world has ever seen. And not only that, it's going to get bigger and it's going to get way better because we serve a living Savior. And when he returns in person, his kingdom will be finally and fully realized. All the Old Testament prophecies will be completely fulfilled. And in the meantime, we can know that as we fulfill God's calling on our life, when you do the role that God has created you to do, to build his church and prepare the world for the full realization of his kingdom come. He is with you. 
He will never leave you or forsake you. Jesus never promises that our journey, our ministry, responsibilities will be easy. But he does promise that we'll never be alone. And he will be with us to the very end of the age. Because he's risen. He is risen indeed. There's a poem that was written by Joyce Ballantyne a few years ago. Some of those words seem just appropriate at this moment. Vicki, would you mind reading them for us? His hand in mine a journey's taken. My faith in Christ is never shaken. His life is my model as I pray. He walks beside me and shows the way. He is God's gift, rich and true. His love sustains me in all I do. Life storms and trials melt away as I place him at his feet each day. His love leads me through this life. He gladly carries each burden, each strife. He's my strength, my rock, my friend. Jesus waits for me at my journey's end. What will you do with the news that Jesus is risen from the dead? And how is God leading you to reveal the kingdom of God here on earth? Whatever you do, when you follow God's call, know that Jesus is with you. I trust that today's discussion of God's word has been helpful and served as an encouragement to not just be hearers of the word, but doers. Together, let's bring God's word to life, to our lives this week. The Crosstalk Podcast is a production of Crosstalk Global, equipping biblical communicators so every culture hears God's voice. To find out more or to support the work of this ministry, please visit www.crosstalkglobal.org. You can also support this show by sharing it on your social media and telling your friends. Dr. Kent and Nathan recorded a bonus episode about the ending of Mark that you can download right now from wherever you get your podcasts or by visiting www.crosstalkpodcast.com. And tune in next Friday as we begin our new discussion through the book of 1 Samuel. Be sure to join us. 